am Daniel Lucas, and welcome to Book 101. Book 101 is all about the books that are read for the last 40 years. And today, I have my special guest. She is a professor at Kani School of Law. And of course, a scholar of environmental justice and human rights. And an author too of several books. No other than Miss Rebecca Bradsmith. Hi, everybody. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, as he said, I'm a, I'm a law professor at CUNY School of Law, where I run the Center for Urban Environmental Reform. And I clearly have trouble staying in my lane because in addition to being a scholar of law, I also uh, write books about uh, hi the history of New York. And I co-produce a series of environmental justice comic books with a very talented artist named Charlie uh, LaGreca Velasco. Yes, Ms. Rebecca, last time we talked about your best-selling book, Naming Gotham, the villains, rogues, and heroes behind New York's place names. Can we do the recap? Sure. It's a sort of fun, gossipy version of New York City's history using the people that we've named roads and bridges and civic institutions after as a way in to learning about the city. So we learn about their individual lives as well as the role that they played in the development of the history of New York. And um, I like to, I think it's fun. It's an easy read. It's designed for people who either are coming to New York as visitors and want to learn more or people who live here and um, all of a sudden ask themselves one day, hey, who was that Major Deegan anyway? Uh, Major Deegan, the, the Major Deegan is a the road that goes past Yankee Stadium. And if you ever take it, you're guaranteed to be stuck in congestion and traffic. Yes, interesting people. Something else that Miss Rebecca shared to the world. So please grab a copy available on Amazon and leading online bookstores worldwide. Miss Rebecca, last time I asked you about your piece about climate change. Today I'm going to ask you what is your piece about AI? Well, you know, that is AI is really taking the academic world and shaking it upside down. Um, none of us are really no, uh, sure what to do about it, what to think about it. Um, I had, I, for fun, had ChatGPT write, I asked it to write a blog post for me, and it wrote something that was yeah, sort of run of the mill. I mean, it, you know, if a student turned it in to me, they'd probably get, except that it made a whole lot of stuff up and was riddled with factual errors. In fact, I asked it to write a blog post about Major Deegan, uh, yes. of the Major Deegan Expressway I was just talking about. And it, um, he, was, uh, um, he was in the Army for a very brief time during World War I, and then he served as New York City's tenement commissioner, which is like the Department of Buildings or Housing Commissioner. And he died young. But according to ChatGPT, he stayed in the army until World War II and was um, died in battle in the Battle of Okinawa and was awarded a um, posthumously a whole bunch of medals. So it was complete and arrant nonsense, um, which I always tell my students because I'm like, you don't want to rely on this because it's making stuff up. Not only is it not very good writing, but it also is doesn't have a sense of fictional versus factual. Do you think mm -hmm. AI is a good invention for humanity? I don't know. Um, I, I think that if you look at sort of the what's happening, I mean, the terrible tragedies unfolding in the Middle East, what we see is so much misinformation, fake videos, um, fake photographs, and stuff that's being written clearly by AI that has no tether in reality. And I worry a lot about that. I worry about what that's going to do for the 
public's ability to understand what's happening around them. In the U.S., do you have a specific law that govern artificial intelligence? No, yeah. we we don't have anything really that governs it. Um, I don't know that any place really does. It. I mean, I, you know, I don't know what to think because. Um, you know, we've seen, for example, when when algorithms get used to make decisions, like um, some courts use them to uh, to guide sentencing based on predictions of recidivism, and it was riddled with racist assumptions that you know worked real injustice in the world. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't think. I mean, these are just databases. They're not inherently good or bad, but they're created by people. So they reflect the biases and um, blind spots that the people who make them have, but they get presented as somehow neutral and beyond the, um, the realm of sort of human biases when in fact they're riddled and, and rooted with them. Yes. So do you think we are still in the toddler zone in terms yes. of AI? Absolutely. So what are your proposal in terms yeah. of the law so that we can govern AI? Oh, this is so far out of my field. You know, I, I, do, I really don't know what the answers are. I just I have a lot of questions and I have very few answers at this point. Yes, very well said. Miss Rebecca, thank you for sharing your thought about artificial <laughs> intelligence. You should have warned me you were going to ask me about that. <laughs> Miss Rebecca, which one of your books are we going to talk about today? Uh, well, I would love to talk about the environmental justice comic books. Um, I, I work, I collaborate closely with, as I said, a very talented artist, and we've made three full length comic books or short graphic novels, depending on how you want to characterize them, that tell the story of young people in a fictional town of Forestville who organize their community to um, fight against environmental injustice and environmental racism, and to instead build community and build a greener, fairer, safer city and then enter uh, electoral politics running on a climate justice platform. Um, I think the books are really fun. They're beautiful. The artist is super talented. Charlie LaGreca Velasco is uh, just such a talented artist. And we've created these books to be used. They're available for free download from my website, which is just my name, RebeccaBratsby's.com. They can be used for any nonprofit or educational purpose. And we are also in the, pro in the early stages of a collaboration with the United Nations, uh, particularly with the United Nations Environmental Program, to make much shorter comics that will be collected in a book about environmental defenders around the world who face incredible dangers to protect forests and rivers and ice and um, e ecosystems. This book, Environmental Justice, a academic book? No, these are, well, there is an environmental justice book that I co-wrote that, that is an environmental textbook. Um, and that is available for sale on Amazon and everywhere that books are for sold. But the environmental justice comic books are not academic books. They're comic books. They're designed for, you know, um, not quite children, but young adults and adults. They're sort of pitched at like an eighth grade reading level. The idea is that people who maybe don't have that much formal education or who are intimidated by textbooks and scholarly books can read them and learn alongside the young prota protagonists as they organize to protect their neighborhood. Environmental justice, law, policy, and regulation. How did you craft it? <laughs> so that's, that's the textbook, environmental justice, law, policy, and regulation. And that's a collaboration. I work with uh, a number of other scholars. And that's a book that's designed to be used in college classes and law school classes to teach people about how to think about environmental law while 
um, uh, in the context of racial injustice and social injustice and inequality, and to understand um, the issues embedded in law and embedded in regulation that are about structural inequality so that they can, so that the people who are taking the class, either the college students or the law students can use their skills to try to make things better. So Ms. Rebecca, can you share example of our environmental law and civil rights together? Yeah, sure. So it, it's a little bit complicated because the way that the Supreme Court has interpreted civil rights law is very, very limited. Um, it is obviously illegal to discriminate on the basis of race, gender, or religion, or um, national origin. But for the most part, unless you can prove intentional invidious discrimination, it's very difficult to bring a case in court. And what, what environmental justice focuses on is, is sort of disparate impact. When regardless of intent, the result is that certain communities, particularly black communities, but also a lot of other um, minority or low income communities are overburdened with um, what we call in the field LULUs. It's an acronym that stands for a locally undesirable land use. Those are things like waste transfer stations or um, power plants or major truck um, facilities that generate a lot of pollution for the local community while generating economic benefits and social benefits elsewhere. So one community has all of the burden while other communities get most of the benefit and the community that's burdened gets very little of the benefit. And it's that kind of dis disparate impact that environmental justice is really focused on. So the idea is to help people, first of all, see that that's happening and that it's a problem, and then to think about where in our law and regulation can we craft remedies? Can we try to make things better and try to make sure that the burdens of environmental bads like pollution are shared more equitably and that communities um, also get fair shares of environmental goods like parks and green space and resilient infrastructure. Very well said, Miss Rebecca. So in real world, I always watching law and order. Is it <laughs> the same? <laughs> the same in the real world in the US? How did no. you proceed the court? No, no, it's those um, those shows are really not very accurate about um, about what happens in court or the role of the prosecutors and the role of the police. I mean, it's, you know, those are stories. They, they have some semblance of reality, but they're, they're not representative of what it's really like to be uh, in a courthouse. Interesting facts. And thank you for that. But before we go on, Ms. Rebecca, I want to talk to the people listening in the United States, most possibly in the state of New York. I have 55 places. I just named them few. And thank you so much, New York. I got 43% audience there. Montgomery, 35%. The Bronx, 5%. Woo. Brooklyn, 2%. Are you from Bronx, Ms. Rebecca? No, I'm, fr I'm from Queens. Korama, 2%. Seville at 1%. Buffalo, Deer Park, Liverpool, Staten Island, New Rochelle, Yonkers, and a lot more. I have uh, uh, lots of places in New York. And thank so you let me so let me much. just say one one thing, if you don't mind, for the yes. people who are listening from Yonkers. In my yeah. book, Naming Gotham, I have a chapter on how Yonkers got its name. It's named after Adrian Vanderdonk who was um, a Dutch settler who was instrumental in ending what became known as Kief's War, which is a war with the Sewanee people that the Dutch uh, governor uh, unwisely pr provoked. And um, Adrian Vanderdonk was the only lawyer in 
New Netherlands. And he was also one of the few settlers who had bothered to learn the local languages. So he was a, he played a critical role in ending that war. And as a result, he got uh, a huge grant of land in what has become Yonkers. Wow, interesting naming of them people. So can I just name some of the places? Uh, Long Beach, if it's yeah, you, uh, yeah, Queens is in the, in the list of my uh, uh, places. Westbury, Rye, Levingtown, <laughs> mm-hmm. Far Rockaway, Tonawanda. That's also in Queens. Oh, okay. Tonawanda, Forest Hills, Larchman. Also in Queens. Lots oh, yeah, of Queens but... people. Yay, oh, Queens. Yahoo. You <laughs> have also Rome in New York. Yeah. You have Rome, Jamaica too. Oh. Also in Queens. <laughs> Del Mar <laughs> and Syracuse, Rochester, Jenica Tabby. I don't know. If wow, there are a lot of places people yeah, from I have New York. a lot. Yeah. Yes. Woodhaven, Floral Park in New York. Norwich, New York. Uh, uh, both, of the, both Woodhaven and Floral Park are in Queens. Ticonderoga, <laughs> Richwood, Woodside, in uh, Pen- Penyam, <laughs> Port Washington, Peekskill, St. Johnsville, Massapequa, Bayville, uh-huh. Bell, Valley Stream, Elman, uh, Saratoga Springs, Freeport, Mastic, West Chasey, uh, Brewster, Brandwood, Hamilton, Batavia, Pleasantville, Katona, Locust Valley, Geneva, Hopewell Junction, and a lot more. I have a lot, like wow. six in That's New That's really all over the state. That's fascinating. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for supporting this podcast, because this podcast is created to empower writers all over the world, like Miss Rebecca. <laughs> Bradsby's Miss Rebecca, Environmental Justice. There a follow up for this book. Uh, yes, actually, we are in the process of making a, a new version of it because that book came out in 2020, and since then, so much has changed um, because of the initiatives of the Biden administration to uh, p- sort of put environmental justice at the center of federal policy, and then states like New York have also adopted a number of really important environmental justice laws. Um, New York amended its constitution in 2022 to include a right to clean air, clean water, and a healthful environment. And, um, and then there was just a case in Montana, a really important environmental justice case. So there's a lot that has happened since the book came out. So we're working on the next edition of it. So do you mean the follow-up will be the amendment? Of the, of the book, uh, the follow the follow up will have some new chapters and will update the existing chapters. So what what do you think will be the additional will, for uh, the second book? So we're gonna well we're going through each chapter right now and rewriting them to make sure that they have the most up to date information about justice is considered in regulation, how it plays out in um, public participation in decision making, because things have changed. And then we're also going to have significant updates to the chapter on climate change and the chapter on um, food justice and on. um, And then the Supreme Court has also made some decisions that make things a little more difficult. So in the chapter on sort of uh, civil rights, we're going to have to make some adjustments as well. Ms. Rebecca, I ask you additional uh, questions mm-hmm. about climate change. What is the United States stand for climate change? Well, um, you know, Congress passed two really important laws in 2021. Uh, one is an infrastructure bill and the other is uh, c- called the Inflation Reduction Act both of which generated large amounts of funding for um, the transition to carbon-free energy in the United States, as well as for um, carbon-free transportation and um, building retrofits and other changes that are going to dramatically reduce the, the carbon footprint of the United States 
over the next, say, decade or so. And uh, I think that's a pretty big deal. I think that there's really a potential to um, to turn the tide because uh, the tide is not going the right way, the amount of carbon we're emitting and what that's doing to our climate. And we're seeing that now be reflected in the weather in terms of the heat waves that are sweeping across not only the United States, but across the globe and the storms that are getting more violent and the places that are having droughts where they're not used to having droughts where the droughts are more prolonged. And the only way to stem that tide is to significantly reduce the amount of carbon that we emit and to um, keep the level of warming below 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius. And we are we can do it, but it requires real concerted effort in countries like the United States, in um, other sort of developed countries that have emitted the lion's share of the uh, carbon that is causing these problems. And the good news is that we have the technology to do it. What we need is to make the decision that we're going to do it. Yes, certainly people. Let's unite and combat climate change because we can see now the evidence that we are really changing. Yeah. So, Ms. Rebecca, environmental justice, low policy and regulation. If you want to go back and revise itself, which part of the book do you want to revise? Um, well, I am working right now on the public participation part and on the part that focuses on uh, how community voices should matter in the decisions. Um, and then I I'm really interested in what happens on the local level rather than what happens on the national or the international level. It's not that I'm not interested in those, but I think change happens in particular places and that the way to have so significant change is from the ground up rather than from the top down. So those are the chapters that I'm really working on is like what's happening in states, what's happening in cities. How can we think about making sure that um, voices that have historically been excluded from these conversations, particularly indigenous voices, are um, heard and listened to and help shape the choices that we make. Definitely. And I'm also really interested in making sure that young people get get um, to participate in these decisions because, you know, we're I mean, we're talking about my life and our lives, but we're particularly talking about what what what, what kind of a world are we going to be handing over to the next generation and the generation after that. And that's why I made the comic books as well, because it's about. Um, sort of youth activism and preparing the next generation to be leaders on these issues. Yes. Well done, Ms. Rebecca. So what challenges did you face while writing environmental justice? Well, it's, it's a really big topic. Um, it's, it was, we could have written a book that was twice as long, but of course, nobody would read it because it would be too long <laughs> and nobody would publish it because it would be, you know, ridiculously expensive. So it's really hard to try to figure out how to make sure that you've, you've really captured enough um, without overkill. And that is, that is the, I think the thing I'm really struggling with, with that particular book with my co-authors, because I'm not doing it by myself. Yes, definitely. So how do you feel your personal experience have shaped your writing? Well, I I live in New York City, as we talked about. And so when I write about the, ur the environment, I really write about the urban environment. I think about the places where people live rather than preserving wild spaces. I am all for for protecting wild spaces and preserving, you know, vast swaths of forest and land. Um, I, I, I believe in that, but I also think that if people who live in cities, because we are 
becoming more and more and more uh, urban population, both in the United States and around the world. The UN estimates that by 2050, it will be like almost 70% of humanity lives in urban settings. So if people who live in urban settings don't think protecting the environment is about them and their lives, we're not going to make the kind of progress we need to make. Certainly. So what is your daily writing routine like? Oh, I wish I were more disciplined and had a really good answer for that. Um, I, you know, I had a friend a long, long time ago when I was first starting out who told me, you have to do it every day. Because if you don't, the, like, the psychological barrier to working on your project will just get bigger and bigger and bigger. So I have this idea that I have to work on it. I have to work on it for 10 minutes every day, no matter what. And after 10 minutes, if it's not working, I have permission to stop um, because I've done what I need to do for that day. But most days, once you get 10 minutes into it, you sort of you get interested and it draws you in. And I wind up spending a couple of hours researching and or writing every day. But um, I do touch it every day, seven days a week. I touch the project in some fashion for at least a short period of time so that that the psychological barriers of, oh, now I have to do a lot because I didn't do it yesterday. Don't build up and get in the way. Very well said, Ms. Verbeck. As of what's one thing or message you hope readers will take away from environmental justice or naming Gotham? Um, you know, both books, have, they're really different books. Like one's a very gossipy history book. The other is a much more scholarly um, legal work. But both of them are really trying to convey the message that individuals really matter and that the choices that we make as individuals can shape what our communities do and that we all have the potential to make choices about how we want to be in the world that are about making things better or not making things better. And I always try to pick making things better whenever I can. And I also just try to convey to people that you have agency. You are a person whose opinion matters and that you should make sure that your elected officials know what your opinion is and should always vote. And you should sort of try to participate in the decisions about your community. Yes, indeed. So Ms. Rebecca, how did you handle criticism both constructive and negative. So how do I deal with criticism, um, both positive and negative? Um, you know, I try to learn what I can from whatever anybody shares with me. Um, you know, sometimes people have just want to tear down and there's not a lot you can learn from the criticism that they offer because it's just, oh, you're a jerk or, oh, this sucks. Um, you know, there's not a lot in there to learn from other than, well, clearly this person didn't like it. But whenever somebody has a criticism about, I don't agree with the way you're approaching this topic or you forgot about this other thing, I try to listen to that and take it seriously and decide and, and you know, think about it and decide, well, do they have a point there? Did I really miss this thing? And if I did, how can I fix that? Um so, you know, anybody who's offering me something of substance, I try to take it and learn from it and do something with it. Yes. Very well said, Ms. Rebecca. So what is the most rewarding aspect of being an author? Oh, seeing people read what you write. It's so exciting. Um, it, every now and like uh, the environmental justice casebook is used in schools across the country. And so if I go somewhere to give a lecture and um, students come up to me and say, we're using your book in our class. Like, that's really cool. Thanks. Or sometimes they'll say, oh, you know, we, I saw your comic books. And that's, that's what it's all about, right? It's all about creating tools that people can use in, in their own lives and their own advocacy. Yes. Thank you for sharing your talents, Ms. Rebecca. And how do you feel about the current state of the publishing industry especially with the rise of self-publishing and digital platforms. Well, it's, it's wonderful that there um, is so much less gatekeeping. 
Um, you know, people can, if you have something to say, there's a way to say it now. You can have your own uh, website where you publish, or you can publish your own work on uh, through one of the self-publishing sort of um, companies that helps you. I think that's wonderful. I also really appreciate, though, the role that editors play in terms of making sure that works are accurate and valid and uh, as good as they can be. The editor that I had for Naming Gotham really made the work better. It was very helpful to have a professional who um, helped me sort of lay out the book, who pointed out a couple of places where I hadn't been as clear. I thought it was clear, but the editor was like, no, you, you know, you, you need to fix this and was absolutely right. It, it, the work became much better because of that input. Yes. Very well said, Mr. Rebecca. If you could go back and give advice to yourself when you were first starting out as a writer, uh, what would it be? I would say just just write it down. Don't worry about <laughs> yeah. it being good. Don't worry about uh, even the grammar. Like, Don't worry about your first draft being anything other than a way to get words on paper because you can edit words. You can't edit air. Definitely. So what is your inspiring message for those aspiring uh, writer out there procrastinating? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, j just do it really just like give yourself permission to, to stop after a couple of minutes if it's not flowing, but just pick it up, see what you can do with it. Um, re if nothing else, read over what you have and like make some notes about what you want to do next. Um, I also always try to stop with something small left to be done so that when I pick it up the next day, there's something clear that I can do right away. And that, that helps get the juices flowing and it helps me get into the groove. Um, but what I would, I would say is like, if, if you want to be a writer, be a writer, don't, don't let anybody tell you not to, and don't stop because you know, what you have to say matters and the world needs it. Definitely. Go for it, people. Stop procrastinating. <laughs> Probably you are one of the best in the making, like Miss Rebecca Braspies. Come on. <laughs> show, show to the world. So, Miss Rebecca, can you please invite our listeners to buy all your books? Sure. Um, I would love it if people wanted to buy um, Naming Gotham and um, Environmental Justice. Um, you know, they're both available pretty much anywhere you can buy books online. Um, Naming Gotham is available in New York and in, in in-person bookstores, but probably not anywhere else. You can also find both books at your library if you don't want to buy them. Um, I would rather uh, read them. I, I care more that you read them than I do that you buy them, to be honest. And yes. like I said, the, the comic books are available for free download for any nonprofit use from my website, which is just my name, RebeccaBradspies.com. Yes, people, let's support Ms. Rebecca because if you support her, more more books to come. <laughs> and, <laughs> and thank you, listen notes, for my latest score of 26 and belong to 10% popular show globally. Thank you, listen notes. And of course, Feed Spot for being the number seven best book art podcast. You need to be follow this 2023. Thank you so much, Miss Rebecca. Thank you for your time. All right. Pleasure talking with you, Daniel. Thank you. Morning, people. See you soon.